access to electricity has always been a problem in Tanzania. From a very early age, I remember that we always had po constant power cuts and rationing every single day. This is a picture of our world at night. That small arrow over there is where I am from. I grew up in northern Tanzania in a small town of Musoma. And yes, I'm African. In fact, I'm third generation Tanzanian. At the time, every time we had a, a power outage, I thought to myself that, you know, because I live in a small town, that's part of the life that we have to, be, that, that, that we have to live every single day. It is part of the convention of being a Tanzanian. Little that, I knew, little that I knew, just about 20 kilometers away from my town, there was an entire community that lived in darkness. Through my father's work, I started getting in contact with these communities. And that's when I realized the kinds of challenges that they face with no electricity at all. Then, in around 2006, I moved to UBC to pursue a degree in chemical engineering. And as part of my degree on the side, I started to do a little bit of research on the challenges that are faced by rural communities because of lack of access to electricity. And some of the things or solutions that they use in order to live within, those, within the darkness. Most of the communities within East Africa and around the world have a tendency to use a littered lamp, a fueled source of uh, lighting. And that was also the case in Tanzania. A lot of the villages that I visited during my childhood would have kerosene lamps. And I also remember my own mother at times uh, lighting up a kerosene lamp whenever we had a power outage and our, whenever our flashlights wouldn't work. And when you think about it, just like when you look at this picture here, this child has a kerosene lamp right next to him. He's using it to be able to read at night. Now imagine some of the dangers that are caused with the, uh, the, the, uh, due to the, the use of this kerosene lamp. First of all, there are toxic uh, uh, fumes that are produced with, uh, from this lamp. On top of that, whenever we, we are working in an office or whenever we're studying and we have a cup of coffee, we always try to keep it away from our paper because we're scared of knocking it over and spilling it. Now imagine the kind of situation this kid is in. So, I started to look for a solution to see what the market has to offer. Because obviously, whenever there is a demand, whenever there is a problem, the free market economy always has a solution. And so we came across three solutions. The first one was this simple lamp, a direct substitute to the kerosene lamp, very effective. In fact, a company called D-Light has designed this lamp, this particular lamp here. There are various models of this lamp across Tanzania. Some of them even have the ability to charge cell phones, enabling communities to access communication. But then, we should think to ourselves, is lighting enough? Is just simply replacing a kerosene lamp enough? So we kept looking. And we came across this little system here. It's re most people refer to it as a small solar home system. These systems are very rare in Tanzania although they have a lot more capability in terms of the options that you can, the things that you can power with it. A few of these can, can power up to entire hospitals, entire schools, but because of the expensive nature of the technology itself, it's very rare. Most of the households cannot afford this technology. And at the same time, it's DC-based. When we talk of electricity, there are two kinds of electricity. We have DC-based electricity and we have AC-based electricity. The electricity that we use in our homes is AC-based electricity. The electricity that we use in our cars is DC-based. So because this runs on a battery, we can't use the normal appliances that we can buy in the everyday market. So again, the things that you can use this with, with, with this system are rare and expensive. And on top of that, the system itself has a limitation to the amount of power you can use. If you wanted to use a refrigerator, the villager would have to invest again in a second panel. So, I was, uh, I was determined to try and look for some sort of a community-based approach that first of all provided the, the village or the household with a means to access AC power. On top of that, 
something that would remove that limitation of having to invest every single time you wanted to use power. But then again, before we could move on to that, we had to go back to the core of the, of the problem. Because these solutions merely are, are treating the symptoms of a much greater problem, which is the lack of infrastructure. So I was quickly able to uh, partner with a local uh, businessman in Tanzania recently, and we started an initiative to start a social enterprise called CarbonX Energy. Now CarbonX Energy's main goal was to uh, find a community-based approach to providing 230-volt AC power to rural isolated villages. So in order to do that, we first had to identify what are the problems that have led Tanzania to be in this situation, and what are the numbers. And believe me, the numbers were shocking. Over 80% of Tanzanians do not have access to electricity. 97%, ladies and gentlemen, 97% of rural communities do not have access to electricity. This was shocking and quite frankly, unacceptable. And part of the reason for that is also because of the way Tanzania's uh, entire uh, rural community is laid out. A lot of the villages are scattered and they're very sparsely populated, making it difficult for the national power company to extend its grid. At the same time, throughout the 40 years uh, that Tanzania has had independence, it had only one single power company until recently when it liberalized the energy sector. And as part of the liberalization, Tanzania formed two agencies, the Rural Energy Agency and EURA, which would act as a regulatory authority and at the same time as a platform that would encourage private participation in infrastructural development. And as part of that initiative, the Rural Energy Agency and the World Bank organized a rural, uh, Lighting Rural Tanzania competition, 2010. At the, uh, during that time, our company was in the, in the middle of developing what, what I'm about to present to you as the community-based approach for isolated villages. And fortunately, we were able to present this, this to the World Bank and the agency and ended up winning the Lighting Rural Tanzania competition. The funds from this competition are now being used to implement a pilot project in one of the villages in northern Tanzania, about 20 kilometers from my home. So what is this concept? Basically, the concept is built around the ability of a village to generate power locally, therefore eliminating the need to extend a, the grid and eliminating the need for building a, a, an infrastructure, a transmission network. We have four parts to the concept. The first part is a solar farm. The solar farm allows the village to generate its own power within its own uh, vicinity. And because Tanzania has 12 hours of sunlight day in, day out, that was the most efficient way to generate power in those areas without any need for maintenance. The other th issue with solar power is that you need to be able to store it, to be able to provide 24 hours of power supply. So that's where we developed a containerized power storage system. Now the reason why it's containerized is because when you think about the numbers, you have 97% of Tanzanians who do not have access to electricity. On top of that, your access to those facilities is very difficult too. So even if you were to, to go at an electrification rate of 10%, at the moment the electrification rate of Tanzania is 1%, you would never be able to make it, even in another 10 to 15 years, to those villages. So we had to come up with a solution that you can basically put on a, on a truck, drive down to the village, drop, connect, and you have power. So we basically took off, up our, our entire storage facility, the inverters, which are the red and yellow uh, things that you see. Don't worry about the technical details, but just the icons. The red and yellow uh, things out there are what allow us to convert D, uh, DC power into grid-based electricity power, what we use here in, in our everyday lives. So all that, the red, the yellow, and the gray battery bank, all go into that uh, pre-wired container. One, what is the other thing that we can do with the pre-wired container? Well, it's modular and it's expandable which means that we can actually go to any village which is sparsely populated, power it up, allow it to use that little bit of power and then build upon that. And as it builds upon the, its power consumption, we can gradually increase the power production by putting consecutive uh, containers. That way, we first of all reduce 
again, the, uh, the risk of investment of the grid, of the transmission line all the way to the village, and we eliminate the need for overinvestment because we are able to grow our power consumption as our power, uh, uh, we are able to grow our power production as the consumption increases. But then we all, so we already had our, our uh, power production and, and, and supplies uh, sorted out. But the other issue was also the distribution within the village itself. Because again, these villages are not laid out in, a, in, a, in one centralized location. So we went to the mapping agency in Tanzania to get some sort of sense of what the layout is within the rural communities. And there was no map. So there was another problem. So we turned to Google. The good thing about Google is that you can integrate it with a GPRS-enabled uh, device. And we have GPRS uh, in all our uh, cell phones, our cameras, uh, anything, any electronic device that we use. So basically what we did was we went to the sample village that we were working on, where we were actually doing our pilot, and geotagged every single home within the span of two days within the central, si central region of the village. We were able to geotag 160 homes. And as part of that exercise, we were also able to uh, take a photo of each house. We were able to coll collect basic data. And all that was put in that single point that you see on that map. So right now, I could open up my computer. And I could click, click on any one of those points that would tell me what is the basic data of that, of that household, the amount, their income, there is their uh, kerosene consumption, and it would give me a little picture. Just like when we Google uh, a shop or an address and it tells you what a, the place looks like, the same way we can do that. And we can figure out wh whether this house is actually able to be electrified or not. But then again, even if it wasn't able to be electrified, we, want, we wanted to take power there. And that was our third problem. So we looked to the market again for a solution, and we found it. Most of the villages in the rural regions are, made, are traditional. They're made out of uh, mud and thatched roofs, making it very difficult to put an inter internal wiring inside the house. The other issue was also that most of these villages or villages do not have access to funds, ready funds that they can actually invest in an, in an internal wiring system. So we developed two systems that would go with the model. The first is a prepaid meter. And there's lots of varieties of prepaid meters in, in the world. It's basically a model that allows villagers to pay for electricity as they consume it, little by little. And it's a model that has been extremely successful within the telecom industry in, in, in East Africa and within the utilities industry. Basically, it, is, it, is a, it, it allows people with low income and variable income to be able to pay, pay small amounts of electricity as they, they get their income on a daily basis. The second part was this small white box called Ready Board. Now this is a, uh, an equipment that has been developed in South Africa. It basically allows, uh, it basically contains the basic components that you need when you, when you wire up a house. A circuit breaker, a fuse box, sockets, and uh, some sort of lighting fixture. So everything is, is in one white box. So basically what we do is we go into a house, we put in a prepaid meter, we put in a ready box, and that house is able to now use power without any wiring. If the person were to buy a refrigerator, all he has to do is plug in and start using it. If he wanted to have light in, the, in, in that room, that one light over there would be sufficient to light up the home. If they needed more, they could simply plug in again and switch on another light. So after considering all this, why is all this important? Well, it goes back to the fundamental reason for having electricity. Most of the time, whenever we hear about rural communities and whenever we hear about lack of access to electricity, the first thing that comes into mind is we relate that to having power or having lighting inside the home. Electricity is not just about lighting. We in the first world use electricity everywhere. It's beyond just the bulb. It is it is about being able to provide a farmer the ability to add value to his produce. A farmer who would otherwise sell his, his, uh, his corn at 300 shillings a kilogram, he can now be able to spend only 50 sh shillings extra and sell that same corn as flour for 700 shillings. 
It is about being able to give the opportunity to a fisherman who has to go fishing every single day because by the end of the day he has to throw away all the excess catch because he can't store it overnight. It is about being able to give the women in our, com uh, in our community the ability to pump water so that they don't have to walk and carry that water over their heads. It is about being able to give the ability to businessmen to run a couple of few more hours into the night and extend their economic activity. It is about giving the child a clean source of lighting and access to the electronic media that we have access to today. So, when, again, whenever you think about rural electrification, it's not just about giving lighting. It's about jump-starting a community. And we are here to do that. We are here to secure Tanzania's future. Thank you very much.